Delacroix is widely regarded as the leader of the Romantic movement in 19th century French art. His life and work embodied the movement's concern for emotion, exoticism and the sublime, and his painting style, full of lush, agitated brushwork and pulsating with vivid color, was in direct contrast to the cool and controlled delineations of his peer and rival, Ingres. Delacroix eschewed academic conventions in his choice of subjects, favoring scenes from contemporary history rendered on a large scale in the most dramatic of fashions, with visibly energized brushwork and dynamic figural compositions. Delacroix's work also embodies Romanticism's obsession with the exotic other, seen in his paintings inspired by a transformational trip to North Africa, but his animal pictures can also be viewed in this vein. Interestingly, many of his works were based on direct observation of nature. He was a prodigious draftsman and took an interest in early photography, which he then combined with a narrative imagination, not surprising given his intimacy with many of the most famous writers of his day. Some controversy surrounds the birth of Eugène Delacroix because of the timing of his father's operation to remove a testicular tumour just seven months before his birth. Most believe, however, that he was the youngest of four children born to parents Victory Eubin and Charles Delacroix, a foreign minister under Napoleon's regime. Delacroix's early life was filled with much loss, including the death of his father when he was seven, his brother was killed in battle when he was nine, and his mother passed away in 1814 when he was just 16. Delacroix displayed an interest in art from an early age. With the encouragement of his uncle, artist Henri-Francois Riesener, he began to study at the studio of painter Pierre Narcisse Guérin, and at 18 enrolled in the prestigious École des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Delacroix received his first commission in 1819 for the Church of Orsament in France, for which he created the Virgin of the Harvest. A year later, he was invited by Théodore Géricault to assist with a commission for the Cathedral of Nantes. Delacroix painted the final work, Virgin of the Sacred Heart, 1822, and split the fee with Géricault. Delacroix had befriended the older artist when both men were students of Guérin. Delacroix had been greatly moved when he saw Géricault's raft of the Medusa, 1818-1819, and Géricault in turn recognized the talent of his young friend. It was also early in his career that Delacroix developed his first bout of tubercular laryngitis that would plague him throughout his life, causing him constant worry about his health. In an attempt to prevent the illness from recurring, he wore a scarf tied around his neck, which, while functional, also helped to establish his reputation as a fashionable man. Mademoiselle Rose, completed between 1817-1824, presents a female nude depicted from the side seated on a wooden pedestal, half covered with a piece of red material. Her left foot rests on a wooden block, while her head is turned towards the artist and is seen full face, adopting a somewhat awkward studio pose. The sitter has been identified as an artist's model, who, according to Alfred Robot, Delacroix's biographer, posed several times for Delacroix and for Richard Parks Bonington, 
and who perhaps distributed her favours impartially between the two artists. In a letter to his friend Pierret, usually dated 1820, Delacroix wrote, I had tried to persuade Félix, Guillemardet, to come and join us tomorrow, but he said that the shortage of money had got the better of Mademoiselle Rose's bottom on this occasion. The sitter's timid attitude and anxious expression helped to establish a sense of naturalistic simplicity, with no decorative arrangement. Although the canvas already experiments with the variations of light on flesh that were to preoccupy the artist later in his career, the pigment, applied in tentative touches in a granular impasto, has not yet acquired the fluidity which was to owe to the influence of English painting. Delacroix first witnessed this technique at the Salon of 1824, when he saw works by John Constable, including the Haywain, inspiring him to make a three-month visit to London to study the works of the developing English School of Art. The Bark of Dante, regarded as Delacroix's first major work. The Bark of Dante is based on a scene from the eighth canto of Dante's Inferno. It depicts a leaden, smoky mist, with the blazing city of the dead forming the backdrop as the poet Dante makes a perilous crossing of the river Styx, guided by the ancient Roman poet Virgil. The smoke to the rear and the fierce movement of the garment in which the oarsman Phlegius is wrapped indicate a strong wind which Dante and Virgil face into. The river is rough and the boat is lifted to the right, a point at which it is twisted towards the viewer. The painting explores psychological contrasts to highlight different responses. Virgil is visibly detached from the tumult surrounding him, but instead uses his right arm to comfort Dante, showing concern for his companion's well-being, serving as a counterpoint to the other's fear and notable unrest. The choppy waters are filled with the twisted forms of the damned, who in a mindless frenzy seek to overturn or interrupt the voyage. Their pallid skins, contorted forms and demonic faces are undoubtedly the most prominent aspects of the entire canvas. Throughout his career, Delacroix was celebrated for his innovative use of colour, which is evident at once in this painting, the theatrical display of bold colours in the figures at the centre of the composition is striking. The red of Dante's cowl resonates with the fired city behind him, vividly contrasting with the billowing blue about Phlegius. The drops of water running down the bodies of the damned are painted in a manner seldom seen until that time. Four different unmixed pigments in discreetly applied quantities make up the image of one drop and its shadow. White is used for highlighting, strokes of yellow and green respectively denote the length of the drop, and the shadow is red. Delacroix's pupil and chief assistant of over a decade, Pierre Andrieux, recorded that his master had told him the inspiration for these drops had come in part from the water drops visible on the water nymphs in Rubens' The Landing of Marie de Medici at Marseille. The pioneering technique of depicting the water drops in the bark of Dante first confirmed Delacroix's status as a master colorist. Theodore Géricault's The Raft of the Medusa, an 1819 over-life-size painting, depicting a moment from the aftermath of the wreck of the French naval frigate Meduse, which ran aground off the coast of today's Mauritania on July 2, 1816, was a powerful influence for Delacroix, the infamous event lead to large parts of the crew being lost at sea for days, suffering thirst and hunger and resorting to cannibalism. In a letter to his sister, Madame Henriette de Verninac, written in 1821, Delacroix wrote of his desire to paint for the Salon the following year and to gain a little recognition. In April 1822, he wrote to his friend Charles Solier that he had been working endlessly for two and a half months for that purpose. The salon opened on April 24, 1922, and Delacroix's painting was exhibited under the title 
Dante et Virgile, conduits par Phlegias, traversent le lac qui entoure les murailles de la ville infernale de Dité. The intense labor that was required to complete this painting in time left the artist weak and in need of recuperation. Critics expressed a range of opinions about the canvas. One of the judges at the Salon, Étienne-Jean Delecluz, destined to become his critical nemesis, was uncomplimentary, calling it a real daub, une vraie tartouillade. Another judge, Antoine Jean Gros, thought highly of it, describing it a chastened Rubens. An anonymous reviewer in Le Miroir expected Delacroix to become a distinguished colorist. In the summer of 1822, the French state purchased the painting for 2,000 francs, moving it to the Musée de Luxembourg. Delacroix was delighted on hearing the news, although he feared it would be less admired for being viewed at close quarters. Some two years later, he revisited the painting, reporting that it gave him much pleasure, but describing it as being insufficiently vigorous. The painting was moved in 1874, 11 years after the death of the artist, to its present location in the Musée du Louvre. Orphan Girl at the Cemetery, completed between 1823 and 1824, this painting is believed to be a preparatory work in oil for Delacroix's next major work, The Massacre at Chios. However, Orphan Girl at the Cemetery has since come to be regarded as a masterpiece in its own right. We are presented with the view of a young peasant girl visiting a cemetery in the French countryside. She bears an air of sorrow as tears well in her eyes and she gazes apprehensively upward. The uncertain tone of the sky and the neglected graveyard are in keeping with the girl's melancholic expression. Her posture and clothing suggest vulnerability as the dress droops from the shoulder, exposing skin and her right hand is left weakly on her thigh. The shadows above the nape of her neck, the darkness at her left side and the cool colouring of her clothing all indicate her passive nature, hinting at a sense of loss or impending doom. Delacroix's shadowing technique from the nape of the girl's neck to the wrinkles of her clothing reinforces the sense of loneliness felt by the orphaned girl. The background is slightly blurred, placing all the attention on the grief-stricken figure at the forefront of the canvas. The exceptional color scheme chosen by the artist for the canvas further evokes the aura of loneliness. Scenes from the Massacres of Chios, 1824, Delacroix's second major oil painting would measure more than four meters tall and concern contemporary events, revealing the horrors visited on the inhabitants of the Greek island of Chios. The military attack by Ottoman forces took place on 11th of April, 1822 and was prosecuted for several months into the summer of the same year. The campaign resulted in the deaths of 20,000 citizens and the forced deportation into slavery of almost all the surviving 70,000 inhabitants. Delacroix's unusual image presents a freeze-like display of suffering victims of war and menacing military tyrants, with no heroic figures to counterbalance the crushed Greeks, indicating the futility of hope among the ruin and despair. The vigor with which the aggressor is painted contrasted with the dismal rendering of the victims, has provoked controversial debate since the work was first presented at the Salon of 1824. Delacroix had been greatly impressed by Jericho's The Raft of the Medusa, a painting for which he himself had modelled, posing as the young man at the front with the outstretched arm. The pyramidal arrangement that governs Jericho's painting is similarly seen with the figures in the foreground of the massacre at Chios. In his unusual layout of characters, Delacroix commented, 
one must fill up. If it is less natural, it will be more beautiful and fecund. Would that everything should hold together? The dense assembly of characters at the front is in marked contrast to the open and dispersed spaces behind them. Land and sea, light and shade appear as bands of drifting colours listlessly running into each other, and Delacroix appears to abandon the laws of perspective altogether with his portrayal of clouds, suggesting a constant opening out. The composition is structurally arranged into two human pyramids. The thirteen civilians, men, women and children, have been rounded up for slaughter or enslavement. They are harshly presented to the viewer in an almost flat plane, their figures slumped, disordered and unevenly distributed. The first pyramid to the left of the canvas culminates in a man with a red fez, and the other to the right culminates in the mounted soldier. The area between the two pyramids contains two soldiers in shadow and two more Greek victims, a young man embraced by a young woman. The man at the front is close to the point of death, and the man poised at the top of the group appears unable to prepare a defence for himself. His gaze is in the direction of the suffering children in front of him, but it doesn't fall on them. This seeming detachment, coupled with the vacant stare of the dying man, gives this group an air of hopeless resignation. In contrast, the human pyramid to the right has an active thrust, portraying a writhing woman tied to a horse. The upward-reaching stretch of the figure to her left, the extended mane of the horse and the twisting and commanding figure of the soldier upon it all add a dramatic element to the composition. At the base of the pyramid, an old woman raises her head to gaze into the sky, while a baby seeks comfort from a corpse. Body parts, including a hand and forearm, and an indistinct congealed bloody mass hover grimly above the infant. In the entries in his journal, Delacroix reveals his desire to break away from the academically sound and muscular figures of his previous major work, The Bark of Dante. Two studies Delacroix worked on at this time, Head of a Woman and the Previous Plate, Orphan Girl at a Cemetery, reveal the combination of unexaggerated modelling and accented contour the artist was striving to introduce into his larger work. The final treatment of figures in the massacre at Chios is however less consistent than these two studies. When the Salon of 1824 opened on 25 August, Delacroix's canvas was shown there as exhibit number 450 and entitled Scène des Massacres de Sio, Famille grecque attend de la mort ou l'esclavage, etc. Scenes of massacres at Chios, Greek families awaiting death or slavery, etc. The painting was hung in the same room that housed Ingres, the vow of Louis the Thinti. This display of two works, exemplifying such different approaches to the expression of form, would herald the beginning of a public rivalry between two of France's greatest artists. For Delacroix, he believed that this was the moment the Academy began to regard him as an object of antipathy. Greece on the ruins of Missolonghi, housed in the Musée des Beaux-Arts de Bordeaux. This 1826 canvas was inspired by the current events of the Third Siege of Missolonghi by the Ottoman forces, when the city's inhabitants, following a long siege, 
decided to attempt a mass breakout to escape famine and epidemics. The attempt resulted in a disaster, with the larger part of the Greeks being killed. Delacroix, like many European artists and intellectuals, was a fervent supporter of the Greek cause. Most of the painting is taken up by the imposing personification of Greece, represented as a young woman wearing traditional costume. Her posture and expression recall traditional religious images of the Virgin weeping over the body of Christ. She is depicted as kneeling, her chest mostly bare, as she spreads her arms in a display of sorrow. The hand of a dead victim can be seen protruding from the rubble beneath her feet. In the background, a black man wearing a yellow turban symbolizes the enemy as he plants a flag into the ground. The image of suffering Greece succeeded in conveying the plight of the Greeks to the French public. The image borrows elements from Christianity, with the blue coat and white robe traditionally attributed to the Immaculate Conception, reinforcing the analogy to a secular figure of Mary. Greece on the ruins of Missolonghi triggered an immediate response from the French poet Baudelaire, who would become Delacroix's greatest critic, the audacity of Michelangelo and the fecundity of Rubens. Other critics disagreed, though, claiming they would have preferred Delacroix to have been less exuberant. The Death of Sardanapalus, Delacroix's most radical work, The Death of Sardanapalus, 1827, reveals the artist's fascination with English literature. The painting is based on Lord Byron's play Sardanapalus, 1821, telling of the final days of the last king of Assyria, originally recorded in the historical library of Diodorus Siculus. The Greek historian writes that Sardanapalus, king of the ancient Mesopotamian city Nineveh, exceeded all previous rulers in sloth and luxury. He spent his whole life in self-indulgence, dressing in women's clothes and wearing makeup. He had many concubines, female and male. Sardana Pallas wrote his own epitaph, which stated that physical gratification is the only purpose of life. His lifestyle caused dissatisfaction within the Assyrian Empire, allowing a conspiracy against him to develop led by Arbaces. In Byron's play, the king slays his favorite concubine and himself as the rebels are about to take his city. But in Delacroix's interpretation of the death scene, Sardanapalus lies languidly on a pink bed, ordering all his concubines to be put to death before Nineveh falls. His palace guards and eunuchs cut the throats of his women as the king seems to calmly watch the mayhem unfold. A nude concubine lies face down on the bed, with arms outstretched, pleading with the unhearing king to spare her life. Meanwhile, to the left of the king, a servant brings a potion of poison ready for the king to end his own life by a more peaceful means. The composition is chromatically fused with reds and golds and broad brushstrokes, vividly bringing to life the slaughter of the Assyrian king's concubines. Nineveh can be glimpsed in flames in the top right corner as the insurgents attack the citadel, hinting that soon all will be lost. Suicide was a popular choice of subject for romantic artists, going as far back as Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, this morbid theme would allow painters and writers to express diverse and dramatic shifts of emotion on an epic scale. In the death of Sardanapalus, Delacroix had taken this convention even further, warping the scene of suicide into a dramatic, chaos-ridden mass suicide. 
Delacroix himself was delighted with the finished painting, though many critics felt he had gone too far. This time the French state chose not to purchase the canvas. Liberty leading the people, universally regarded as Delacroix's masterpiece. Liberty leading the people commemorates the July Revolution of 1830, which resulted in the ousting of King Charles de Fatizix of France, following his tyrannical repression of election laws. The grand painting depicts a personification of liberty as a Greek goddess, leading her people forward over the bodies of the fallen, while holding the flag of the French Revolution, the tricolour flag, which remains France's national flag, in one hand and brandishing a bayoneted musket with the other. The canvas was completed in the autumn of 1830, and in a letter to his brother dated 21st October, the artist wrote, My bad mood is vanishing thanks to hard work. I've embarked on a modern subject, a barricade, and if I haven't fought for my country, at least I'll paint for her. The painting was first exhibited at the official Salon of 1831. Delacroix portrays Liberty as both an allegorical goddess figure and a robust woman of the people, with heavy limbs and underarm hair. The mound of corpses acts as a base to a pyramidal structure, which Liberty strides, barefoot and bare-breasted, out of the canvas and into the space of the viewer. The Phrygian cap she wears had come to symbolize liberty during the first French Revolution of 1789-94. The exposed breasts illustrate her as a nourishing figure, as though she is the mother of the people. The painting is now regarded as a marker to the end of the Age of Enlightenment, as many scholars see the end of the French Revolution as the start of the Romantic era. Delacroix is careful to represent the accompanying fighters from a mixture of social classes, ranging from the bourgeoisie represented by the young man in a top hat, a student from the prestigious École Polytechnique wearing the traditional beacorn, to the revolutionary urban worker as seen by the boy holding pistols. Though each comes from different social strata, they all share a fierce determination for justice and at the apex of the composition is the French flag, the colours of which are echoed throughout the painting, with the blue, white and red tones subtly built up in the garments of the different figures. For creating liberty, leading the people, Delacroix received the Legion of Honour, and the French government bought the painting in 1831 for 3,000 francs, with the intention of displaying it in the throne room of the Palais de Luxembourg, as a reminder to the citizen king, Louis-Philippe, of the July Revolution, through which he had come to power. This plan did not come to fruition, and the canvas hung in the palace's museum gallery for a few months, before being removed due to its inflammatory political message. After the June Rebellion of 1832, the picture was returned to the artist. Delacroix was permitted to send the painting to his aunt Félicité for safekeeping, though it was exhibited briefly in 1848, after the Republic was restored in the revolution of that year. Finally, in 1874, Liberty Leading the People entered the collection of Palais de Louvre in Paris.
Known for his independence, Delacroix defied French artistic tradition by not applying for the prestigious Prix de Rome, the usual way for artists to gain career recognition, and instead established himself through regular exhibitions at public salons beginning in 1822. He also strayed from classical themes and adopted a more modern approach by depicting dramatic narratives, often drawn from current events, with heightened colour and dynamic compositions. This can be seen in such epic works as Scenes from the Massacres of Chios, 1824, The Death of Sardanapalus, 1828, and Liberty Leading the People, 1830. These paintings helped establish Delacroix as a leader of the Romantic movement, a label he did not always relish. He was known to associate with the literary Romantics, including novelist Victor Hugo. His initial respect for Hugo later soured when he became known as the Hugo of the Palette. A turning point in Delacroix's career was his 1832 trip to Morocco with Count Charles de Mornay, who was Louis-Philippe's special ambassador to the colony. France conquered Algeria in 1830, and the North African country became a French colony. Delacroix spent six months travelling around the country with the diplomatic delegation, and he was charged with documenting the journey in artworks. One of the highlights of the trip was a visit to the Sultan, who gifted Delacroix a horse that he later sold to fund the purchase of Moroccan objects he brought home with him. The sights, sounds and strange new culture Delacroix encountered, most especially the people, their costumes and the light and atmosphere of the Mediterranean land, would result in the creation of an entire body of work inspired by this journey. Finding models, however, was not always an easy task since many of the Muslims he met would not pose for the artist due to their religion's prohibition on the depiction of human images, and, as a result, many of his subjects were Jewish people who were better able to welcome Delacroix into their homes to be sketched. Delacroix wrote of the trip, The aspect of this country will remain forever in my eyes. All my life long the men of this noble race will live and move in my memory. It is they who have really brought back to me the beauty of the ancients. The women of Algiers, in 1832, Delacroix travelled to Spain and North Africa as part of a diplomatic mission to Morocco shortly after the French conquered Algeria. At that time it was common to take artists along in order to visually document such a journey. Delacroix went not primarily to study art, but to escape from Paris in hopes of witnessing a more natural culture. During his time there, he produced over 100 paintings and drawings of scenes from or based on the life of the people of North Africa, establishing a new interest in Orientalism. Delacroix was entranced by the people and the costumes he encountered, and the trip would go on to inspire the subjects of many of his future paintings. The artist believed that the North Africans, in their attire and their attitudes, provided a visual equivalent to the people of classical Rome and Greece. At the time he wrote to a friend, the Greeks and Romans are here at my door, in the Arabs who wrap themselves in a white blanket and look like Cato or Brutus. The famous canvas, The Women of Algiers, was completed in 1834 and first displayed at the Salon that year, where it was universally admired. King Louis-Philippe bought it and presented it to the Musée du Luxembourg, which at that time was a museum for contemporary art. After the death of the artist in 1874, the painting was moved to the Louvre, where it is held today. It portrays a peaceful scene of Algerian concubines in a harem with a hookah, used to smoke hashish or opium. In the 19th century, the composition was controversial for its sexual undertones and orientalism. The painting served as a source of inspiration to the later Impressionists and has gone on to inspire many other leading modern artists. 
As Islam forbade naturalistic images and women were veiled in public, it was difficult for Delacroix to find female models to draw from, and for this reason studies of men predominate his African sketchbooks. As soon as he would attempt to sketch women from a distance, who would be hanging their washing out on roof terraces, they would immediately alert their husbands. However, for this following canvas, a former Christian who had converted to Islam and had collaborated with the French is believed to have allowed Delacroix entry into his harem. The artist finished his sketches for the painting during his final hours in Algiers, having lingered there for a few days on the way back to France. Harem scenes in paintings and books were popular in Delacroix's time. French Orientalist painting took off with Napoleon's Egyptian campaign of 1798, the year in which Delacroix was born. European men regarded the harem as a mysterious private bordello, and to a certain extent this painting plays with this notion of exotic charm. As European artists could not obtain access to a harem, an aura of mystery had arisen surrounding the practice. Their fantasy depictions were therefore obviously pure inventions and often hardly believable. In contrast to those works, Delacroix could rely upon his own eyes, giving his work an incredibly realistic and powerful quality. However, unlike most preconceptions of the time, the women depicted in the scene are fully clothed and not explicitly sexualized. The three concubines are sat sedately on the floor, not sprawling seductively. They appear as thoughtful and remote beings in control of their surroundings. A black turbaned servant pulls a curtain away, affording us a glimpse of the inner harem, where the door is only partly open, giving a frustrating impression of the mysteries still surrounding the place. In the foreground, the detailed still life depictions of the hookah pipe, slippers, cushions and rugs add to the painting's intimate atmosphere. While studying the topography, people and costumes in Africa, Delacroix developed a deep appreciation for the brilliant colour in the intense light of the southern Mediterranean. It was here that he also discovered the principle of complementary colours, finding that shadows are made up of colour. The artist saw that tones could be divided into separate colour surfaces so as to render hues and contrasts more vividly. In the women of Algiers, the vivid contrasts of colour in the rugs, pottery and costumes serve as vehicles for his documentary realism. It is not known whether he was familiar with Chevreau's theory of the complementarity of colours, although there is a colour circle in a sketch made for his Taking of Byzantium of 1840, listing the three complementary pairs of colours, yellow-violet, blue-orange and red-green. When complementary colours are placed side by side in close and thin brush strokes, they blend together in the eye and become a diffuse grey, more effective than a grey that is the result of a mix. Throughout the painting, Delacroix uses complementary colours, such as the complementary blue and green of the women's clothes, placed next to each other to create the strongest contrast for those particular two colours. Delacroix was one of the first artists to employ this technique to such a great extent, and his works would have a lasting influence on the Impressionists and other subsequent artists. Delacroix was avid writer who kept journals throughout his life. In fact, his main diary was collected and later published as a three-volume series titled Journal. Although of great importance and insight into the artist, the document is not a typical diary, but contains various information from train schedules to addresses, memory aids, working methods, and ideas about art. 
Upon returning to France, Delacroix's career was marked by important official commissions, including the project for the Salon du Roi and Library at the Palais Bourbon and murals for the Church of Saint-Sulpice. He also painted scenes for the Library of the Chamber of Peers at the Luxembourg Palace. All of this decorative work was physically draining for the artist, and beginning in 1844, Delacroix began to spend more time at his country house at Champrosay, where he could rest and recuperate. His later life was marked by periods of poor health, which impacted his productivity. He had to stop working for a time in the early 1840s. His housekeeper at the time, a woman named Jenny Le Guillou, carefully monitored his recovery. Delacroix never married, but was known for affairs with numerous women, including his models, and possibly even Le Guillou, who was with him until his death, and to whom he bequeathed a self-portrait from 1837. Self-Portrait, 1837 In his first self-portrait, completed in 1822, Delacroix chose to represent himself as the central figure in Sir Walter Scott's novel, The Bride of Lammermoor, masquerading as the dark and ill-fated Edgar, master of Ravenswood. At the time, the Paris of the Romantic era was very much under the spell of the works of Scott and Byron. The historical novel was all the rage and the French romantics, notably Victor Hugo and Alexandre Dumas' père, were subject to this combined influence. As early as 1821, at 23 years old, Delacroix took great pleasure in painting himself as the in vogue Ravenswood. However, Delacroix's more famous Louvre self-portrait, completed 15 years later, would prove a more lasting and genuine impression of the painter. The self-portrait of 1837 was bequeathed after Delacroix's death to his devoted housekeeper, Jenny Le Guillou, with the condition that it would eventually be allowed into the national collection. Confidently, the artist comprehends us, dressed in a rich green Scottish waistcoat, denoting his success. Light floods onto his face from the left, while his expression suggests a calm and measured assurance, while there is no sign of his profession in the arrangement of the painting. The famous French poet Charles Baudelaire met the artist for the first time after the portrait was completed, noting, Eugène Delacroix was frail and delicate, a curious mixture of skepticism, politeness, dandyism, willpower, cleverness, despotism, and finally, a kind of special goodness and tenderness that always accompanies genius. Medea about to kill her children in 1838 Delacroix exhibited Medea about to kill her children at the Paris Salon, provoking a sensation among the critics. His first large-scale treatment of a scene from Greek mythology, the painting depicts the Colchian sorceress Medea clutching her children, with her dagger drawn, about to slay them in vengeance for her abandonment by Jason, as narrated in Euripides' play Medea. The three nude figures form an animated pyramid, while light floods into the cave form the left, only penetrating the hidden shadows. Medea's face itself is half hidden in gloom, encapsulating the mental strain and torment she in undergoing. The angelic face of the child to the left is partly hidden from us by the mother's firm grip, as the son feebly tries to break free from the fate that awaits him. However, there is an almost protective stance to the mother's posture, giving the image an ambiguous nature. Critics were quick to discern the influence of the Italian Renaissance in the work, in particularly Leonardo da Vinci's The Virgin of the Rocks, and even Delacroix's greatest critic, Delicluz, compared the work to Correggio's Divine Jupiter and Antiope. Though the painting was quickly purchased by the state, Delacroix was disappointed when it was sent to the Lille Musée des Beaux-Arts. 
He had intended for it to hang at the Luxembourg, where it would have joined the Bark of Dante and the Massacres of Chios. Always a lover of literature and music, Delacroix enjoyed gatherings that put him in contact with leading creative people of the era. A friendship with the novelist Georges Sand and her lover, the composer Chopin, for instance, began with a commission to create her portrait. Sand was famous for her practice of dressing like a man and did so for her portrait, but Delacroix playfully warned her against it as a man, in his opinion, could be a villainous beast. Portrait of Frédéric Chopin In 1838, Delacroix began work on a double portrait of his two close friends, the French romantic novelist George Sand, 1804-76, and the Polish composer Frédéric Chopin, 1810 to 49, who were lovers at the time. The portrait remained in Delacroix's studio until his death. Shortly afterward, it was cut into two separate works, with Chopin's segment containing only a headshot, while Sand's segment shows her upper body, though it is narrowly cut. This led to the loss of large areas of the original canvas. The reason for the divide was most likely due to the belief that two paintings would sell for a higher price than one. Today, Chopin's portrait is housed at the Louvre in Paris, while Sands hangs at Copenhagen's Ordrupgard Museum. George Sand was one of the first female French writers to establish an international reputation. She became known for behavior unusual for women at the time, including openly conducting affairs, smoking a pipe, and wearing men's clothing. Sand had been a friend of Delacroix for a number of years, though the painter did not regard her work highly. She met Chopin in 1836, and from 1838 conducted a relationship with him for ten years, until two years before he died. Much of the composer's best work was done during those ten years. Though their relationship began as physical, Chopin's failing health in time changed her role to that of caregiver. Sand introduced Delacroix to Chopin in 1838, and the two men remained close friends until the composer's death. The double portrait displayed Chopin playing the piano while Sand sat and listened. Little is known of the painting's origin or the circumstances of its execution. It is not known whether it was a commission or intended as a gift to the composer. The double portrait was left unfinished, and ironically one of the elements that was not painted was the piano. In his native Poland and in France, where he composed most of his works, Chopin's music, his love life and his early death have all helped to make him, in the public consciousness, a leading symbol of the Romantic era. His works remain popular and he has been the subject of numerous films and biographies of varying degrees of historical accuracy. Fanatics of Tangier, during his time in North Africa, Delacroix made many sketches of the people and the city, subjects to which he would return until the end of his life. And the unusual large canvas Fanatics of Tangier, 1838, housed in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, presents a frenzied scene of the Esauan Brotherhood, which the artist had first-hand experience of witnessing a Sufi brotherhood that would annually meet in August at the tomb of their founder, Sidi Mohammed ben Aisa. These religious fanatics would engage in many unusual activities, while enlisting new converts and raising funds for their cause. Hidden in an attic, fearing for his life if discovered, Delacroix watched the gathering while sketching away. Reportedly, the members of the sect were 
rolling themselves on embers, eating snakes, grinding glass, chewing fire, slashing their flesh, quivering in spasms like charged frogs, in a sacred epilepsy. Delacroix began work on fanatics of Tangier in autumn 1837, his notebooks filled with plenty of useful material, and the canvas was presented at the Salon of 1838. Although somewhat eclipsed by his Medea about to kill her children in the same Salon, Fanatics of Tangier was celebrated for its lively brushstrokes, ably summoning up the frenzy of the zealous subjects. The English Review in the Times declared the painting to be the most outstanding in the show, even if the subject was a little disagreeable. Hamlet with Horatio, Delacroix was without doubt an Anglophile, his works often being inspired by the literature of Scott and Byron. However, during the 1820s, it was the works of William Shakespeare that were going to take the Parisian art world by storm, fusing the imagination of artists and composers as much as they had done in Germany through the works of Goethe in the previous century. The plays of the Elizabethan playwright represented for Delacroix the embodiment of the British spirit. In 1825, Delacroix chose to visit England, not Italy, to study the old masters like so many of his predecessors, where he could immerse himself in the emerging British school of art, which he wished to see at first hand in the works of Constable and Bonington. Whilst staying in London, his impressions of the foreign capital were mostly mixed, and he felt that the culture of London was overall lacking in comparison to Paris. Nevertheless, he was greatly impressed by the quality of drama on the London stage, chiefly in the presentation of Shakespeare's works. During the course of his artistic career, Delacroix would produce numerous paintings inspired by Shakespeare's plays, as well as a suite of 13 lithographs in 1843 on Hamlet. The following plate, completed in 1839 and held in the Louvre, concerns the famous Yorick scene in the play, shortly before the Danish prince delivers his to be or not to be speech. The foreboding sky, eerie graveyard setting, and the dark portrayal of the tragic wind-swept protagonist are all typically appealing choices for the romantic painter. The canvas was exhibited in the Salon of 1839, along with Cleopatra and the Peasant, also based on a Shakespeare scene.
the Sultan of Morocco and his entourage, yet another image gleaned from Delacroix's foreign adventures, the following canvas was produced in 1845, over ten years after the scene depicted, and is currently held in Toulouse's Musée des Augustins. Although the artist's principal intention may have been to immortalize his patron, the Comte de Mornay's diplomatic meeting with the Sultan, Delacroix chose instead to focus his attentions on the African subjects instead, entirely leaving out his French comrades. Of primal interest in the composition is the rich blue African skyline that so entranced the artist during his travels. Never before had he seen such light. The portrayed scene is revealed as an open-air panoply of bright, vivid colours and monumental oriental figures. Moulay Abd al-Rahman ibn Hisham, 1778-1859, was the Sultan of Morocco from 1822 to 1859 and a member of the Alawite dynasty. In the composition, scores of attending soldiers watch their Sultan as he majestically hovers above, mounted on a nobly bridled horse. However, the figure that catches our eye the most, strangely overshadowing even the Sultan's high standing, is a towering parasol. All alone in the brilliant azure sky, the parasol seems to make a mockery of man's social distinctions. When exhibited at the Paris Salon of 1845, the critics were unanimous in their praise. The art critic Théophile Torre Burger wrote in his review of the Salon that year, All the figures are calm and noble, as tranquil orientals should be. Delacroix has attained to one of the highest points of art, magnificence and grandeur in simplicity. In the later years of Delacroix's career, he drew inspiration from nature and painted numerous works, featuring gardens and flowers. He also continued to focus on large-scale tableau and decorations, and in 1850 was selected to paint a mythological scene on the main ceiling of the Apollo Gallery in the Louvre. This work was widely praised and deemed such a success that the artist received 6,000 francs more than originally contracted. These paintings would influence the work of early modernist artists such as Odilon Redon, whose Pegasus and the Hydra, 1905, was directly influenced by Delacroix's Louvre ceiling painting Apollo Slaying the Serpent, 1850-51. Basket of Flowers Overturned in a Park, 1848-49 During the later years of his career, Delacroix turned more and more to nature for inspiration. Basket of Flowers Overturned in a Park is significant because, though the artist had created sketches of trees, plants and flowers throughout his career, this was his first formal flower painting. Compared to his monumental contemporary history paintings, the work is intimate in scale, measuring only a little more than three by five feet. Nonetheless, the painting was exhibited at the 1849 Paris Salon, along with women of Algiers in their apartment. The floral subject was one of several that Delacroix worked on at his peaceful country estate, Champrosay, in the immediate aftermath of the bloody 1848 Revolution and Paris Commune. Unlike traditional still lifes, which tend to be arranged indoors upon tables, here the setting is a lush outdoor garden complete with green shrubs and trees. The painting features a straw basket turned on its side, out of which tumbles an abundance of flowers in red, yellow, pink and orange. The basket is directly underneath a flowering vine that sprouts up from the left side of the canvas and trails to the right across the full width of the painting, forming a kind of proscenium arch. A red flowering bush at left accords with the colourful blooms on another shrub in the right middle ground, as well as the blooms in the centre. Indeed, the emphasis on colour and composition gives an overall impression of harmony, 
something the later Impressionists would seek to create in their own outdoor scenes. According to Delacroix scholar Simon Lee, the artist wanted his treatments to be free from the vases, drapes and columns that were the usual conventions of flower paintings. For him, too many flower painters concentrated on the botanical details, but his paintings were to be like a bouquet of flowers where the overall effect was more important than the individual blooms. This unique approach was a modern one that would directly influence the work of artists such as Claude Monet, Vincent van Gogh and Odilon Redon, who would build on this and take their own individual approaches to their floral paintings, focusing on the effects of light, color, and the overall impression of the flowers, rather than traditionally realistic formal renderings of flower arrangements. Apollo slays Python, 1850, 51, in 1850. Delacroix received the most important commission of his artistic life, involving the decoration of the Senate and Palais Bourbon libraries and the monumental Salon de la Paix at the Hôtel de Ville, including the decoration of the Galerie d'Apollon in the Louvre. Following a fire, Laveau had reconstructed this historical gallery for Louis XIV, while the decoration was entrusted to Charles Lebrun. Then, in 1678, Louis left Paris for Versailles and work had ceased. In 1793, after the French Revolution, the Louvre had become a museum and the Second Republic deemed the completion of the decoration a Republican duty. Lebrun had intended a subject dear to the heart of the Sun King, Apollo on his chariot. For Delacroix, to make his mark at the very heart of the Louvre, the home of all the great masters, by decorating the central part of a ceiling was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Before he began the commission, he left France for Belgium, feeling the need to study Rubens' works one more time. The subject of Apollo slays Python is taken from the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses and concerns the victory of good over evil, taking the general form of beauty, vanquishing the ugly, and genius overcoming ignorance. Delacroix honors Lebrun's intention to depict the mythological figure of Apollo in the gallery of that name, though the artist extends the allegory with a further message close to his own heart. Intelligence wrestling with barbarity and light struggling through darkness. By emphasizing the contrast between the two parts of his composition, the world of the sun above and that of darkness beneath, Delacroix transforms Lebrun's project and raises it to the plane of an eternal symbol. A ceiling painting, Delacroix's Apollo slaying the serpent, features a story from mythology in which the god Apollo shoots arrows at the giant serpent Python while riding in his chariot. The dying creature writhes in the sea below while a blast of smoke escapes his mouth. Other gods can be seen in the sky including Apollo's sister Diana, who is positioned behind him holding his quiver, as well as Hercules, Mercury, Minerva and Vulcan. Boreas and the Zephyrs are sending in rain clouds as Juno, Venus and Ceres watch the battle. In describing this work, the artist wrote, From the highest heavens, victory descends to crown Apollo, and Iris, the messenger of the gods, unfurls her scarf on the breeze as a symbol of the triumph of light over darkness and the rebellion of the waters. Delacroix was commissioned to create this painting as part of the restoration of the Galerie d'Apollon in the Louvre. The architect of the project, Félix Dubon, described the motivations behind his selection of Delacroix. 
The name of this eminent artist provides a guarantee that the work will be successful. Still, the project was challenging in that Delacroix had to try to find a balance between creating a new work and making it fit with the pre-existing ceiling paintings. Ultimately, the work was so well received that Delacroix's payment was increased from 18,000 to 24,000 francs. The reason behind Delacroix's choice of subject matter led to much speculation. Some saw the victorious mythological battle as a metaphor for perseverance of the French people during years of revolutions, while others have tried to assign a personal meaning to the work with the gods' triumph as a statement of Delacroix's success over his art world critics. While neither interpretation was confirmed by Delacroix, the painting clearly demonstrates his mastery of the new romantic style, which he employs here to depict the conquering of good over evil through color, light, and complex figural composition. The good figures are rendered in bright, vivid colors and awash in light, while the evil forces are in dark tones and shadow. The attention to color, so evident in this work, has been attributed to both Delacroix's interest in and study of the work of Peter Paul Rubens and Michel Eugène Chevreux's theories on color. For instance, Delacroix contrasts the warm yellow and orange tones above with the cooler blue and violet tones below. Van Gogh would employ similar techniques in his paintings from the south of France in order to intensify the impact of his palette. The Sea from the Heights of Dieppe, the 1852 Canvas The Sea from the Heights of Dieppe demonstrates Delacroix's importance for the Impressionists. The rapidity of the brushstrokes prefigures the works of the en plein air school to follow. The thick, dramatic brushwork and intense color tones would have a lasting impression on the works of Monet, Renoir and Cézanne. Although Delacroix is chiefly remembered for his mythological and grand-themed canvases, in his later years he took great delight in depicting flowers and landscapes, painting these less ambitious works at his leisure, enjoying the changing spectacles of daylight seascapes, nocturnal scenes and foliage. The artist's friend, the novelist George Sand, once described how she walked in on him, ecstatic in delight before a yellow lily whose beautiful architecture he had just apprehended. Another friend noted how she he had once discovered him prowling around rose bushes. Christ on the Sea of Galilee, Christ asleep during the tempest, 1853. Based on a story from the New Testament, Delacroix's Christ on the Sea of Galilee depicts a sleeping Jesus in a raging sea. Wearing a white gown and a blue robe draped around his head, a halo of golden light surrounds his head as he rests peacefully with his head in his hand at the end of a rowboat. Meanwhile, a group of frantic men struggle to get control of their vessel on the storm-tossed sea. One man in the center waves his hands in the air in a gesture of helplessness, while to his left another reaches out to grasp an oar that has slipped away. In the distant background we see a hilly landscape silhouetted against a gray, cloud-filled sky. Though religious subjects had long been part of the canon in France, Delacroix approached his subjects differently. Less intent on illustration than on getting to the heart of the spiritual matter, his images were motivated not by a need to inspire, but a need to understand, on a very personal level. As Delacroix said toward the end of his life, God is within us. It is that inner presence which makes us admire the beautiful, which delights us when we have done right, and consoles us for not sharing in the success of the wicked.
It is he who, beyond a doubt, creates the inspiration of men of genius and who warms them at the spectacle of their own productions. There are men of virtue as there are men of genius. Both are inspired and favoured by God. On a formal level, the composition and brushwork of the painting would be an example for later modern artists, including post-impressionists like Van Gogh. Delacroix was a master at group scenes, and the writhing, twisting and dynamic forms of the figures, other than Christ, that is, add to the scene's sense of agitation, fear and excitement. Likewise, his bold and expressionistic brushwork contributes to the painting's drama, particularly in the sea and sky, as if to indicate the unpredictable and powerful forces of nature at play. The greatest rival of Delacroix was none other than Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. It is said that at the time there was a major artistic disagreement in the art world, summarized as the fight between color and line. Delacroix stood for color, while Ingres and the neoclassicist tradition he was continuing from David thought line most important in painting. The two men had various run-ins. In one anecdote, Ingres asked for the windows of the Louvre open to air out the smell of Sufa that a prior visit by Delacroix supposedly left in the museum. Major recognition came late in Delacroix's career with his one-man show at the 1855 Universal Exposition. While 35 of his greatest works were exhibited, his two most politicized and controversial works, The Death of Sardanapalus, 1827, and Liberty Leading the People, 1830, were only added after the Emperor intervened and insisted on their inclusion. After this success, in 1857 he was finally elected, after seven failed attempts, to the Académie des Beaux-Arts. Moroccan Saddles His Horse, 1855 Jericho had instilled in Delacroix a fascination with horses, the emblematic beasts of romantic painting. But his love of horses was fully satisfied only during his travels through Morocco. From then on, the Arab horses that he had seen and drawn during his voyage would provide a valuable repertoire for him to draw upon in later years. During the mid-1880s, Delacroix received many commissions from private collectors for small Orientalist pictures of Arabs mounting, tending or riding their horses. This 1855 image is now housed in St. Petersburg's Hermitage Museum and depicts a scene of touching harmony between human and horse. As the Arab lifts the bright red saddle onto his steed, they share a moment regarding each other a look of mutual respect seemingly caught in the noble way each figure is heroically represented by the artist. The horse's mane is blown back by a gentle breeze, while the Arab's billowing white garments, contrasting with the rich brown of the horse's coat, are shaped in a muscular pose. The man's ornate sabre is restricted to the ground on the far left corner, the hint of violence distanced from the harmony of the scene. Lion Hunt, 1861. From as early as the 15th century, Western artists have been fascinated by the mystery and exoticism of the Middle East. Lion Hunt, 1861, painted almost 30 years after Delacroix's travels, reflects an interest in hunt pictures previously established by his beloved Rubens. Delacroix's direct observation of wild animals at the Jardin des Plantes in company with the animal sculptor Bari also helped to produce this incredibly charged image. Wild animals fascinated the artist 
and are found throughout his sketches and paintings. One of Delacroix's friends even went so far as to liken him during his passionate frenzy of his artistic endeavours to a lion, noting how his tawny eyes with their feline expression, his slender lips stretched tight over mighty teeth, his firm jaws emphasised by strong cheekbones allowed his features an untamed, estrange, exotic, almost alarming beauty. Now housed in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Lion Hunt displays the all-action scene of five men battling two lions, with the humans appearing to be faring mostly the worse in the encounter so far. Swirling around the central figure of the embattled lioness, the composition draws its dynamism from the passionate fusion of colours and expressive turbulence of Delacroix's brushstrokes. The poet Baudelaire wrote of the canvas, It is an explosion of colours compelling admiration. This intense and somewhat chaotic scene portrays a group of Arab men leading an attack on two lions. On the left, a rider and his horse have been felled by a female lion, while another figure attempts to spear the lion from behind. In the background, at the apex of the loosely pyramidal composition, another huntsman gallops toward the mayhem with sword raised. In the centre foreground and to the right, we see four more men attempting to kill a male lion, who has trapped one of the hunters under his enormous paws. A victim of the beasts lies on the ground, just behind this group. This painting was part of a series of works Delacroix created on the theme of the lion hunt, and is considered to be among the last of his large-scale masterpieces. It highlights the artist's interest in and experimentation with the dynamic arrangement of figures for dramatic effect, which he had explored throughout his career. It also demonstrates the artist's fascination with animals, which he studied intensely. His sketchbooks were full of graphite drawings of both domestic cats and wild ones, including lions, some of which he made at the zoo in Paris's Jardin des Plantes. Indeed, Delacroix was a great admirer of animals, and wrote in his journal of being fascinated with how the foreleg of the lion was like the monstrous arm of a man whereas some of Delacroix's earlier lion hunt scenes took a close-up view of the violence and dramatic action, here there is a greater sense of depth to the scene, enhanced by the distant view of the sea. Though the setting is vague and general, the exotic costumes of the men help situate us in some imaginary orient, perhaps inspired by the artist's reminiscences of North Africa. The swirling brushstrokes and vibrant colours of the fighting men and their flowing and luminously coloured garments is echoed in the waves of the water and the swirling clouds that seem to move across the sky. Delacroix was without a doubt inspired by the lion hunt paintings of Peter Paul Rubens, which he first encountered in 1854 through reproductive engravings. Rubens, like Delacroix, was a master of the painterly brushstroke and is often seen as Delacroix's predecessor in this regard. This work is a smaller-scale copy of the original large canvas, dated 1855, and now destroyed. Delacroix often created smaller versions of his exhibition pictures. A related oil sketch is in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, which was likely a preparatory study for the finished canvas, Ovid among the Scythians, Delacroix first painted the subject of the Roman poet Ovid exiled among the Scythians 
In 1844, as part of the decorations for the ceiling of the Library of the Palais Bourbon in Paris, the subject concerns the historical events following the Emperor Augustus's order for the poet to be banished to the Black Sea port of Tomis, then part of Scythia in modern-day southeast Romania, where Ovid spent his last eight years writing the forlorn poems such Tristia and Epistulae ex Ponto. Much mystery still surrounds exactly why Augustus exiled the poet, with many laying the blame to his scurrilous and risque verses. The Scythians were an ancient Iranian people whose way of life was described by Herodotus in his histories as nomadic, and Ovid himself described them as a wild tribe, serving as a severe contrast to the refined lifestyle he was used to in the Eternal City. Nevertheless, Delacroix's 1859 canvas of the subject, held in the National Gallery London, depicts the Scythians in a different light. They treat the poet with sympathy and curiosity in a pastoral scene reminiscent of the works of Claude Lorraine. In the foreground a man milks a large mare, while behind him various figures are casually placed, standing still or reclining peaceably on the grass. A child is nursed in its mother's arms, and shepherds are glimpsed resting. Meanwhile, stretched on a gentle incline, swathed in drapery, Ovid appears to shyly greet the friendly approaches of the inhabitants of the previously supposed savage country. The sublime wildness of nature and misunderstood genius were key concepts in Romantic art, which Delacroix is keen to exploit in the painting. Ovid among the Scythians was exhibited at the Paris Salon of 1859, the last in which Delacroix participated. At the time of its exhibition, the landscape with its mountains was universally praised, while the mare in the foreground was considered strange by some critics. Théophile Gautier greatly admired the painting, ironically naming it the The Female of the Trojan Horse. Baudelaire, in his last Salon criticism, called the painting one of these amazing works. Delacroix knows the design and painting, but not everyone was pleased with the composition. Maxime Ducamp dismissed it as a spectacle of irremissible decadence and went so far as to advise the artist to return to the literary works that he loves and to the music for which he was certainly born. Having provoked negative criticism, even among some of his most fervent admirers, Delacroix decided to work up a second version, this time integrating the figures and landscape and rectifying the alleged problems of scale of the first version. Critics had deemed the unusual composition and strange scale of the characters a particular shortcoming. The second version comprises many elements of the London version, though it features more vivid colours, replacing the barbarian with a large shield on his back with a woman bringing food, while closely harmonising the figures and landscape more in keeping with a historical landscape. Completed a year before the artist's death in 1862, it was most likely commissioned by a private collector. It was given to Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, in honour of Philippe de Montebello in 2008. During his final years, Delacroix suffered from an increasingly fragile constitution. In addition to his home in Paris, he also lived at a small cottage in Champrosay, where he found respite in the countryside. From 1834 until his death, he was faithfully cared for by his housekeeper, Jeanne-Marie Le Guillou, who zealously guarded his privacy and whose devotion prolonged his life and his ability to continue working in his later years. The great artist passed away in Paris on 13th August 1863, aged 65, and was buried in the city's Père Lachaise Cemetery. Perhaps Delacroix's most influential friendship from the literary world was with the much younger avant-garde poet and art critic Charles Baudelaire, who enjoyed drink and opium and would later be put on trial for obscenity. Baudelaire was a strong supporter of Delacroix's career and helped champion his art in his writing. In his 1863 The Life and Work of Eugène Delacroix, Baudelaire memorialized the artist calling him a volcanic crater artistically concealed behind bouquets of flowers 
and described how he was passionately in love with passion and coldly determined to seek the means of expressing it in the most visible way. Indeed, Baudelaire positioned Delacroix, along with his favourite writer Edgar Allan Poe, as the leader not only of the Romantic movement, but of the modern movement in art as a whole. Delacroix continued to paint until the end of his life, but in his last years, perhaps as a result of personal reflection, he increasingly focused on Christian-themed works. Despite his great artistic output, near the end of his life, he wondered about his legacy and once wrote, What will they think of me when I am dead? The legacy of Delacroix extends beyond his central and generative role within the Romantic movement. His approach to subject matter, the dramatic poses of his figures, his emphasis on expression and emotion, his exploration of natural light in his outdoor landscapes, and his dramatic use of colour laid the foundation for the work of the first modern artists, most notably the Impressionists and later Symbolists. In particular, Delacroix's division of tones would have an enormous impact on the work of artists like Monet and Pissarro among the Impressionists, and his awareness of the power of complementary tones led ultimately to the colour theories of Georges Seurat. These artists spoke repeatedly of Delacroix's influence and often created paintings inspired by his most famous works, sometimes even directly giving the artist credit. For instance, Pierre-Auguste Renoir's The Jewish Wedding in Morocco, after Delacroix, 1875, Vincent van Gogh's Pieta, after Delacroix, 1889, and Paul Cézanne's Apotheosis of Delacroix, 1890-94. Other artists created visual mementos to the artist, as in Henri Fontaine Latour's Hommage to Delacroix, 1864, which depicted modern artists surrounded by a portrait of Delacroix in acknowledgement of the debt they owed this visionary artist. The influence of Delacroix continued into the 20th century, as seen in Pablo Picasso's The Women of Algiers, after Delacroix, 1955. Never one to want to share the spotlight, Picasso nonetheless spoke admiringly of Delacroix and gave credence to his enormous influence on modern art when he famously stated, that bastard he's really good.